to get started. This is a beautiful turnout. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Jimmy Schultheis, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Karma Public Library and Foundation. And before we get started on our program, we have some really great news at the Foundation, and that is that we have a brand new executive director who's just joined us this month. And so I would like for you to welcome Alexander Fallon. so much. I'm really excited um, and honored to be helping to move this library mission forward and to carry on this incredible legacy. Um, if you read the newsletter, you'll see next month that I really did raise my three boys at the Children's Library for six years every Saturday for three hours. So I'm really, this is a heartfelt opportunity. As I look over some of the crowd here, which is a fantastic turnout, and I attribute that to Doug and his interesting program. Um, I see some of the parents that I taught ballet and jazz to at Sunset Center, two doors down before the renovation. Um, and I also see some other folks who I've known on the Mission Trail and elsewhere for the last 30 some odd years. So anyway, I'm really excited about these programs as well. And, um, and just to, to say a little bit about tonight's program, the Henry Mead Williams Local History Lecture Series is sponsored by Frank and Eva Buck Foundation and Robert and Lacey Buck. So I would like if you could just raise, say, acknowledge and say thank you so much. And I know this is a really exciting program, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Janice back to introduce our speaker. So thank you. the speaker, I just want to make a few remarks about the Carmel Library and the Library Foundation. Um, for more than a century, the Carmel Public Library has been a treasured cultural center for our community, offering free programs, services, and library collections to more than 112,000 library patrons and visitors every year. The Carmel Public Library Foundation was founded to raise funds to operate the library. Our mission is to ensure free library service in perpetuity. Every book, CD, DVD, technological access, all services, equipment, resources, and programs are funded by charitable contributions from people like you. The Karma Public Library Foundation, as well as the colleagues like Friends of the Library who do a wonderful book sale every year, makes providing all of your library services possible. So, I would like for you to consider making a gift to the Carmel Public Library Foundation. And um, we, have our, um, we have our $10 suggested donation here, which is, this is a free program, but we're welcoming donations. And if you are so moved, we would love for you to join the Library Foundation in our work by making a charitable contribution. And we have a, a wonderful event coming up in May, uh, the Foodie ed Edition. Is coming up on May 17th, featuring celebrity chefs and international best-selling food writers Nancy Silverton, Ruth Reichel, and Evan Kleiman. There will be a VIP reception opportunity, live demonstration, and a li at the Sunset Center, and a lively panel discussion. So please visit the Sunset Center website to purchase your tickets. So now for our presentation tonight. Tales of some Carmel characters of long ago. As many of you know, Carmel by the Sea has a rich history that has been shaped by eclectic individuals from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. Tonight, former city administrator and avid local history researcher Doug Schmitz is here to present some tales of Carmel by the Sea in City Hall and outside the walls. So please help me welcome our speaker tonight, Doug Schmidt.
presentation, if the foundation puts on to ask questions during the presentation. And yes, you'd like to refrain until we're finished because there's a lot of material and I don't want people to lose track of where we are. So please, please refrain from that. There are some thank yous that I need to extend. First of all, to Janet and Ashley. Janet is not here this evening. She had a dental emergency come up, but Ashley is Ashley or did you disappear to? Anyway, um, it was their idea to present to Amy at the foundation that I'd be asked to speak this evening. And then to Alex, where did you disappear to, Alex? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You've been wonderful to work with the last couple weeks, and she helped put together the presentation. As to Katie, who's on the video tonight at Local History, and Wendy, who's back there too. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, over here is one of my sons and his wife, Megan. And they're going to thank you because they made a trip to the Alameda County Courthouse to do some research for me. Yeah. And they, they disproved something that I had found in my research. So thank you, Carter and Megan. And then to Kathy Bang, because this photograph and several others this evening are Kathy's photography work. So thank you. If you're a journalist, you have the five W's if you're going to tell a story. Who, what, when, where, and why. And I owe you a thank you because you come out on this lugubrious winter's evening with the threat of rain, and you don't have the foggiest idea what the hell I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Some stories of old Carnell characters. If you go to a Tom Parts play at the Cherry Foundation, you know it's Zelda or it's Dorothy Parker or Gertrude Snyder. You don't have an idea that I'm going to talk about. I just hope on your way home you think those, that guy didn't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> So who? Who am I going to talk about this evening? There's four main characters. Two of them are pretty familiar to us. Herb Heron and Argyle Campbell. I won't spend a lot of time on their biographies. The other two are more obscure. Sadie Van Brower and Peter Mosley. All these people interacted in different capacities between 1920 even a few years earlier for several of them, in 1941. Sadie and Peter were city clerks, elected city clerks, back when that position existed. Argyle was an early patron of the Forest Theater, along with Herb Heron. And then Argyle was also the city attorney. And as you know, Herb was on the city council multiple times, and was also the mayor multiple times. And then there's a supporting cast whose names will be mentioned this evening, and then there are also some names that will make cameo notation of this evening for you. So who are these people? I'll get into that a little bit. What am I going to cover? I'm going to cover city events, the growth of the city, city politics, between 1920 and 1941. There'll be a little prelude beginning in 1916 to get us to 20 to uh, jump off, and there'll be an epilogue afterwards closing out what happened with these characters. All of the wear is within Carmel by the Sea. There's one reference to Argyle Campbell's trip in 1937 to DC, which is an integral part of his future dismissal by the City Council. But the bigger question is why did I take this? In these subjects. And there's two reasons. One, as you have heard, and some of you may know, my educational background and my professional career was in city management and city planning. And I was always intrigued from when I start, started to hear stories about Sadie and Peter from some people who lived here that I got to know in the 1960s about their contributions and how they had been overlooked. And when I actually got to Carmel and started doing research on them over the years, I was more intrigued by their contributions, even though they're pretty obscure in our history. But the second, more important reason is a comment I followed up on that A.J. Liebling once penned, and it was, every city has one period of magnificence. <laughs> every city has one period of magnificence. And to me, 1920 to 1941, was Carmel's period of magnificence. In his magnum opus, Cities and Civilization, Sir Peter Hall talks about cities in their golden ages. 
And he talks about what are the characteristics that create these periods that we've heard of in many cases where seas blossom. Athens in the 5th century, Florence during the Renaissance, London during the Elizabethan and Shakespearean times, Vienna at the end of the 1800s when music was right there, and Paris in the late 1800s and early 1900s with the writers and the painters. Those were those cities' period of magnificence. They're special epics. And between 1920 and 1941, Carmel by the Sea had some of those same characteristics Sir Peter Holt spoke about. The political climate was right, the economy was booming, and the arts, the creative class, engendered a fulfillment that brought about a blossoming of those communities and of our community. If you look at the political part, in 1916, the citizens decided they wanted to separate themselves from the county. And they wanted to create a special place, a different place. A place that didn't have hotels and restaurants along the beach, a place that had open spaces, a place that had windy streets. The political element was there to do something different, not just to become another city. Economically, between 1920 and 1941, this city boomed. Even though it was punctuated in the very middle, almost the exact middle, by the Great Depression. It was bookended when it, right after it incorporated in October, the following April, the country entered World War I, and 1941 was when we entered World War II. So we had three significant major events during that golden era, and this community still blossomed. In 1920, the assessed value of the land and the improvements was $600,000. <laughs> By 1940, it was just shy of $4 million, $3.95 million. That was Sadie's assessment. Sadie was not only the city clerk, she was the assessor. The county also did an assessment. And I'll tell you about the fights between Sadie and the county and the councils in a little bit. But the county's assessment was almost $5 million of Carmel improvements and unimprovements in 1940. So despite the terrain of a depression, the community continued to grow. The difference between building permits issued in 1935, the value, and building permits issued in 1937 was 100%. August of 35, there was $15,000 of building permits issued. August of 37, there was over $30,000. Between 1935 and 36, the assessed value of Carmel by the Sea increased by 22%. So we had the economy that Hall spoke about, we had the politics, but what about the creative class? And I'm going to leave some artists out here, and I'm going to leave some craftsmen out here. But we had Joe Mora. We had Xavier Martin's hands. We had Rachel. For photography, we had Weston and Slevin. Of the writers, we had Jeffers, Stephen, Lincoln Stephens, Flavin, Hopper, Dewberry, Bechdel, Harry Leon Wilson. For the crafts and the trades, we had John Catlin, Francis Whitaker, Hugh Comstock, MJ Murphy. And then we had all the names that I didn't mention. But we were all in the con they were all in the constellation at the same time. The creative class that Hall wrote about existed. And what did they create? They created institutions. Most of those institutions that we recognize today that we're party to were founded during this era. In 1927 was the Carmel Art Association and the Carmel, Bach, or the Carmel Music Society. In 1931 was the Carmel Business Association which was the forerunner of the current Chamber of Commerce. In 1935 was the Bach Festival. In 1938 was the school district. There was a Sunset School District. In 1938, Peter Mosley led a crusade to get the city severed from the Monterey School District. That was successful. And by 1940, we had a high school up on the highway. But 
but the physical landscape of the city and the region changed too. In the 20s, the North Dunes were purchased. The planning work began on the highway between Carmel and San Simeon. The Carmel Mission restoration continued that Father Casanova had started in the 1880s and continued under Monsignor Mestres. The second phase of improvements for Sunset School commenced and the Pacific Grove to Carmel Highway was built. In 1925, the newly renovated La Playa Hotel opened and Herb Heron built the Seven Arts Building. In 1928, the Harrison Memorial Library was opened. In 1929, La Libera, which is now Cypress Inn, was built. In the same year, just down the street, La Rambla, which just went through a major renovation, was right next to the Seven Arts Building, was constructed and opened. In the 1930s, the highway between Carmel and San Simeon was finished due to WPA project money mostly. But as you can, you can still see the remnants of that era if you drive from here to Big Sur. How many made that drive? <laughs> Did you go across the bridge at Wildcat Canyon, right in the highlands? Did you go across Garapata Creek Canyon? Did you go across Granite Creek? Did you get to cross the Big Sur Bridge? All of those were built between 1931 and 1935. There's memorial signs on each of those bridges about the year that they were built, and they were all during this period of the 1930s. In 1931, the Boy Scout House was built. The Carmelite Monastery at San Jose Creek was constructed. The land was donated in 1925, which is why the plaque out on the highway says found in 1925. The actual building was dedicated by the Bishop McGinley in 1931. Presby Hall at the Mission was built. Devon North Park was landscaped. In 1937-38, the Carmel Sanitary District opened its first plant in the Carmel River. The fire station was opened. The forest theater was transferred to city ownership. So about the only two buildings we have today, public buildings, that were not constructed or acquired or developed in this period of time is the public works the police building on Unipro and the city hall. But the seeds for the city hall began in this era. In 1941, the Episcopal Church acquired what was called the White Cedars property at Knife and Dolores. And they went through the process of developing their plans. They entered into a lease purchase agreement with the city for the site on Monteverde. They opened their new facility in 1951, and the city moved into City Hall. So the seeds for that building originated during this golden period. The golden period can be broken down into three parts, 1916 to 1924, 1925 to the mid-30s, and then 30s to the 40s. And there's a different orientation for each of those. Herb Heron loved to tell the story. And the last time I can find you publicly told it was in March of 1962 to the Carmel Business Association. And it's not quite accurate, but I can see Herb's telling it, is that in order to qualify as a city in the sixth class, that there's a technical, a te technical description under state law, you have to have 500 residents. There's a series of items related to being a city of the sixth class. The bottom one is really a city item, and I didn't get the asterisk on it. The rest of them were all cities of the sixth class. You needed a population of 500 people. All those who were in favor of the corporation we come up with was 499. <laughs> one day in early summer of 1916, <coughs> Herb said that a young couple who had recently purchased property and built a house in Carmel by the came in and were visiting with him, and she announced she was pregnant. <laughs> and Herb ran out into the street, yelling, we have our 500 citizen, we can file for the corporation. <laughs> and they did that. In August of that year, 54 citizens signed a petition in Wendy County, that's over 10% of what the estimated population was at that point. The lower street of the Pine Cone estimated the population to be 530. The petitioner said it was about, about 550. 
but it was enough to get the county to do the necessary work in September to put this on the ballot the end of October. And we know what happened the end of October. We're a city. Citizens voted to incorporate Escarmel by the city. Those first years from 1916 to 1924 were primarily internally focused. You're building an organization and institution from nothing. The very first ordinance that the Board of Trustees, which didn't become the City Council until 1927, the very first ordinance they passed set the date, the time, the location, the frequency of City Council meetings. And then from there on, it was building an organization, business licenses, preliminary, very rudimentary zoning ordinances, setting up classifications for employees, setting up pay, rate, pay ranges for employees, defining the duties of the city clerk, the city attorney, and the city treasurer. They passed ordinance number seven with the help of Sadie, who was quite an advocate, even though she wasn't the city clerk yet, for tree preservation. We were internally focused at that point. There were still activities going on externally, as I recited some of the buildings were constructed during the early, late 20s, the early 20s. But the organization was principally internally focused. That began to change in the early to mid 30s, or I'm sorry, 20s. And it became more physical. I uh, ran off that list of property that were acquired or buildings that were constructed. And then about 1934, there was a city council elected, a majority, three members, very pro-business, and the organization begins to focus again internally through a series of events, which I'll describe in a few moments. There's a cycle to cities. The cycle is there's progress, and there's pushback, and then there's dormancy. In Carmel, between 1920 and 1941, went through each of those cycles. There was the progress of the new construction, of the economy, of the institutions. There began to be pushback in the mid-30s, and by 1941, the golden era had petered out, and it was gone. Several things contributed to that. One was those who were of the creative class had grown older or had died off, and second, we entered World War II. Now, Hall, in his book, talks about Golden era is lasting anywhere from 10 years to 100 years, depending on the size of the city, the dynamics, the neighborhoods that are created. Ours is about 21 years. So this is just for fun. We hear things keep coming up again and again and again in Carmel. year after year, decade after decade. So here's some headlines. Parking this summer. Parking in Carmel? And headlines from 1931. Carmel Drug Company, that's from the 1920s. Molly Erickson just had a big win by getting the uh, horse racing uh, endeavor at Monterey Downs. Well, in the early 30s, at the Damani Hotel, they had steeple chasing and race horsing. A lot of news lately about Monterey and the wharf. Well, there's a headline from the early 1940s. The revenue was lagging on the wharf incomes. <laughs> and the bottom right, those of you who remember from a few years ago when the renovation took place at the Forest Theater, some things never changed. That's from 1941. <laughs> uh, history repeats itself. So who was Sadie Ben Brown? Sadie was born in New Orleans in January of 1868. She was the third of Four children. She had two older sisters, Jeanette and Laura, and the younger brother. Two years later, when the younger brother is born, the family moves to New York. Her dad was from New York, Sydney. Her mother, Amanda, Jeanette, was from Texas. Sadie has no formal education, but she loves dance. And so she prowls around and dances in New York City. Her older sister, Jeanette, 1887 meets a man named Richard Hoagland. The Hoaglands move, he works for the US government, he's assigned, transferred to Oakland, California. They move to Oakland. They have a son, Brower, born in 1891, who was later killed in World War II, or I'm sorry, World War I. 
and they have a daughter, Jeanette, born in December of 1993. Mother Jeanette dies within two weeks after giving birth to daughter Jeanette. And so Sadie, doing nothing but dancing in New York, offers to come, move into the Hopeland house, and raise the children. The 1990 census identifies her as the housekeeper. I'm 18. 1900. 1900. She continues to do dance instruction in the Bay Area. In 1905, for a reason I have yet to be able to discover, which was one of the efforts that my son Cardiff went looking after, she adds the name Van to her last name. She becomes Sadie Van Brown, not just Sadie Brown. In 1907, she and the niece, Jeanette, visit Carmel, and like many people, fall in love with it, go back, pack, move out of the Hoagland house, and move here. Hoagland will eventually follow in 1921 and get several municipal assignments to the efforts of Sadie. Sadie and Jeanette end up on 14th in the County Unincorporated area. She eventually buys property at the northeast corner of Santa Lucia and Lincoln, builds a two-story shingle house, and she and Jeanette do dance lessons there, all during the teens. The ads of the newspaper say the dance lessons are on Thursday afternoon for children, late Friday afternoon for children, and Friday night for adults. In 1916, when the city was on the ballot to incorporate, there was also slates of candidates for positions. There was the Board of Trustee candidates, there were the City Treasurer candidates, there was the City Clerk's position. There were two candidates for clerk, Joe Hands and Henry Longren, both active in the community for a good many years. Two days before the election, a man by the name of J.E. Nichols he was active in the fire department. He was the acting fire. He was the fire chief of the brigade. Did local carpentry around town. Says I'm running. Throws his hat to win, and he wins. He beats hands by 17 votes. He meets Henry. Beats Henry by 20 votes. Nichols runs for re-election in 1918, and there's a candidate named Grace Wickham. Grace is a dancer like Sadie. She's a prolific writer of plays and producer of plays at the Forest Theater. She's also a librarian. She beats Nichols overwhelmingly. Nichols gets fewer votes in that election with just one candidate running against him than he got in the election he won with two other candidates. Wicca announces in early 1920 that she's taking a position at the post office, will not stand for re-election. Sadie announces she's running. There's a Richard Dewey who announces he's running, whose career has been in acrobatics. <laughs> he's been a traveling acrobat. <laughs> when Richard passes away, his headline says, Colorful Carmel Character Passes. <laughs> Sadie beats him and she's on her way. She's known as a longtime property owner and she's known as an advocate for trees. So amongst the items to show you her Love for Trees. It's a quote from 1938 in the city council meeting. And Sadie asked the mayor after there had been a long discussion about authorizing tree removals, which the council did, for the floor. And she said, there is no one but me to speak for trees. She said with deep emotion and tears flowing from her eyes, they are like humans to me. Our beautiful trees are going. You let people hack the limbs and the beautiful pine trees so that they can see the ocean. And pending tears then continue to come down our cheeks. As an elected official, you have no business authorizing the removal of trees. She got a quick rebut from Council Member Joe Burge, who said she was out of order. Councilmember Clara Kellogg said, no, she has the floor of the mayor gave it to her. She's a member of the community. And we may not like what she's saying and chastising us, but she has the right to do it. In 19, 
32, the Cohen had asked some of the officials for their New Year's resolutions. And here was Sadie's. Throughout the year, I'll make it a point to save each tree, whether oak or cypress or merely pine. I'll protect each life with this life of mine. I'll never give up for acts and saws are abhorrent to me. In 1983, Vice Mayor Frank Lloyd, in an interview about Sadie, told us she was not very tall. She was very lean with a weathered face. This is the only picture we have in the library of Sydney Van Brown. And she appeared on the stage as a solo dancer at the inaugural performance of the Forest Theater in 1910, David. This is it. Someone who was in public life for over 30 years, this is the one picture that we have of Sadie. She had a weathered face and sharp features. She had a very strong personality. She lived in a big old shingled house at Northeast Corner of Lincoln in Santa Lucia. She had been a dancer and she taught dance school here before she was elected city clerk with her niece Jeanette Parks, and she became quite a village character. A lot of the kids in Carmel took dances from her. I remember she always said she wanted to die under that big pine tree in her front yard. But something happened in 1910 or soon thereafter between Sadie and her parent, because I can find no evidence that Sadie was ever asked to dance again at the Forest Theater. It could be information I haven't seen, but in going through all of the play programs, Sadie's name never appears again. Jeanette Hoagland's name appears as a dancer. Grace Wickham's name appears as a dancer. I cannot find Sadie's name listed. The only time after 1910 I can find was reference to Sadie's dancing is in 1930. President Herbert Hoover's son, was visiting the Henry family in Monterey. His wife was from Monterey. And there's a reference to Sadie, who by this time is in her 60s, performing that evening in a dance routine. There are other incidents where you can tell there was tension between Sadie and her parent. Multiple times over the course of the next three decades, her parent is asked in interviews to talk about the early days of the Forest Theater. He lists other characters who performed in David and other plays at the theater. Not once does he mention Sadie. If you read his diary, which he kept a daily entry of, all of the comments about Sadie are primarily very derogatory. So she does typographical errors and doesn't take responsibility for them, blaming them on the typewriter. <laughs> She's disagreeable with the members of the council and the public. And Heron begins to plot Peter Mosley for a challenge to Sadie in the late 1930s, which occurred in 1940. Here's what I quoted from. There's a picture of Mosley with some council candidates for councilmen in the 50s. Peter Mosley was born in England, like in China. In 1886, he had several siblings. He was trained in the civil service of the British parliamentary system and served in the military during World War I. The exact opposite of Sadie. He's structured, he's educated. In 1922, he and his wife board a freighter to New York, and on the manifest, it states their destination is San Francisco because he has read Jack London and read about California. When he gets to California, he comes to Carmel, as with Sadie and John Catlin, loves the community, and they put down roots here. And Peter becomes actively involved immediately. They're naturalized as citizens in 1927. 
But before that, he joins the real estate office on Ocean Avenue of Hogel. It becomes Hogel and Maudsley because in his training as a public servant in England, he was the deputy clerk for a district and was responsible for land. He was an accountant by training. He was an appraiser by his experience. So he enters with Hogel's. They have Hogel's and Maudsley real estate. He becomes president of the Monterey Peninsula Board of Realtors in the early 30s. He becomes the financial advisor to the school district, to the group of, in the school district who want to sever from Monterey. He does the feasibility study about the financial implications and the process for undertaking that. That's successful in 1938 by a vote of the citizens of Carmel and a vote of the school board in Monterey. They then put him on the school board. He becomes the president. He selects the land because of his real estate background. That's the eventual site of where Carmel High School was built. Somewhere in the 30s, he meets Herb Heron. And Herb Heron takes Peter under his wing. And that leads to some events in the late 30s and 1940, which I'll discuss in a moment. I think most of us are familiar with Argyle. He's principally known as the drafter of Ordinance 96, the preamble to the zoning code, which resides on the wall behind the city council about Carmel being primarily, essentially, and predominantly a residential community. Born in San Jose to a man who was the district attorney. He came here in the early 1900s and became actively involved not only in law, but also with the Four Seager. So he and Herb Heron had a long time relationship. Perry Newberry used to separate the community into the arts element and the business element. And you would think that a lawyer who had a business both here and in Monterey would fall under the business category. Absolutely not. Argyle was the one that advocated for winding streets. He advocated for the possibility of putting a wall up around Carmel. <laughs> he was not your typical attorney. He was deep into the arts. And then we're all familiar with her. Her was on the council a couple times, mayor multiple times, and the founder of the Forest Theater. So here's some fun things that you find when you're doing research. You get your laundry done at Del Monte because every day is horse day. And in 1931, just two years after the what's now the Cypress Inn open, you can get a Thanksgiving dinner for a fairly reasonable price. <laughs> $1.25. The beginning of the end of the golden era, in my opinion, began in 1934. There were three council members who got elected who were from the business community, but they were more strident than previous councils had been. There was a lot of rumors going on in town about this council. The Pine Cone had not endorsed all of the slave candidates, they particularly the city and their comments about one of the members who was the one of the persons who was running. And it was so bad that the murmurs in the community that Perry Newberry, of all people, wrote an editorial. And he said, A, we have to give them a chance. But second, the business community has always run the city council. Since 1916, those 18 years, there's only been three members of the arts element that have been on the city council. Herb Heron, Fred Bechtel, and myself. So this is nothing new. In 1936, there's two other candidates who run, or who are elected. Clara Kellogg, who's a retired teacher from Minnesota. She's been on the school board. She's an advocate for good causes. And Edward, Edward Smith. Now, how many have seen Smith Tree Service around town? Yes, Edward Smith was the founder of that tree service. Also a pro-businessman. I have tried to find out what their party affiliation was because in a couple years that may become important and something that happens internally. I can't find the records. The county voters office doesn't have them. The History Society doesn't have them. But I suspect, because the community at that point in time was primarily Republican, that the business community, the business representatives on the council were Republican. 
So we have elections in 1934-36. At the swearing-in of Kellogg and Smith in April of 36, there's a new city treasurer, Ira Taylor. And Ira asked the council to authorize an audit of the city's financial books because they haven't been audited in 10 years. At the May meeting, the council hires Schaff Brothers from Monterey. It takes them a year to do the audit. Someone said the audit when it arrived was the equivalent of God with the wind in size. <laughs> in summary, the Schaff Brothers find 76 properties that have been underassessed, not assessed, have bonds which are lagging in payment, and Sadie is the city tax assessor. Argyle Campbell is asked to do an investigation. And Argyle meets, he reports to the council the next month six times. He meets three times with Sadie, twice with Schaff Brothers, one meeting of both parties. And then he goes off on a mission to Washington, D.C., on behalf of the city of Monterey, whom he was also city attorney, with the blessing of the council, and authorized his absence. And he's gone over the 4th of July weekend, and Sadie spends the weekend in City Hall, as she says, quote, triple checking the numbers. And she finds 46 errors that Schaff brother made. What she doesn't enunciate is that there are nine lots that she or Jeanette Oakland Parks, her niece, own, which haven't paid assessments in the last year or two. But at the council meeting on July 7th, 1937, she attacked Schaff with her facts. The council had wanted Campbell to do a report, an investigation. All he had done for the last month was have six meetings and say, I'm still looking at it. They essentially relieve Argyle Campbell of the responsibility for audit investigation assigned to the city judge, George Ross. And then later that week, there's a telegram sent to Argyle Campbell from Everett Smith, mayor. And it says, in recognition of your many years of service to the community, we are offering you the opportunity to resign your position by July 21st or at the meeting of July 31st, we are abolishing the position of city attorney and you will be terminated. A little problem on the timing. Campbell's already back in Carmel. The telegram is forwarded here, he picks it up, and he does three things. First thing he does is draft his letter of resignation. Second, he prepares an ordinance for the council's consideration to abolish the office of city clerk. And third, he rallies the community. And so at the next council meeting, the council chambers are filled, the streets are filled, shoulder to shoulder, and the arts element attacks the council. And you can imagine how well the mayor's initial comment goes over when the arts element community asks him, or tells him you shouldn't have done this, and he says, it's within the council's prerogative. You can't question the council's policy decision. That set the tone for the rest of the debate. Fred Beckel asks, when was this done? The mayor says, at the last meeting. The art settlement members ask Sadie to retrieve the minute book and bring it out. There's no reference to this in the minute book. The council is scrambling for why they did this. Some members say he's gone a lot. Others say he's incompetent. Third member says we don't like his opinions, which was borne out in an item about the Red Cross ambulance. And Joe Berger, a council member of Short Temper, who the Pine Cone did not endorse, said it looks like they're being attacked by a bunch of damn Democrats. <laughs> Argyle Campbell was the chair of the State Democratic Party. Yeah. <laughs> 1936, the year before, had been a presidential election year. His name was in the paper all the time. So you have a 
bit of partisanship that crept into the termination of Argyle Canada. Of course, what this does is take Sadie's audit off the page. No one cares about Sadie's audit right now. Campbell's gone, there's spread of recall. And then you can see the hand of her parent reach in. Because by the time the recall petitions were gathered, statements were issued, the election was set, the election was held, it's holiday season, 1937. And here it says to his followers and the supporters of recalling this council, let's leave the threat there. But beginning in early 1938, people are going to start filing for council. And we'll run a slate against them. There are a lot of people who call upon Herb Heron between then and March wanting to run for city council on that slate. Amongst them is Frank Townsend, Charlotte Townsend's dad. Hmm. There's an entry in Herb's diary where he says, received a call from Frank. He wants to come and talk about the slate and be on it. We're going to visit tomorrow. And then the next day there's an entry that said, Frank came, explained to Frank that, quote, under the current situation, these are the circumstances of who's going to be on the slate. End quote. Frank's not on the slate. In true Dick Cheney fashion, her parent puts himself on the slate. <laughs> Along with Gordon Campbell's, or uh, Argyle Campbell's son, Gordon, who's a Stanford grad school graduate, and who graduated from the law school at the University of Oregon, and Fred Bechtel, reaching back in the Carmel, active member of the arts community, a famous writer who wrote for magazines on the East Coast. Two of the council members who are up for potential re-election decide not to run, Mr. Thorburn and Mr. Burge. Mr. Roundtree does run, and makes the fatal mistake as if he's politically tone deaf of saying this is just an effort to get Argyle Campbell city attorney here. Even though Campbell has said he doesn't want the job, even though his son is running, there'd be a conflict. Roundtree finishes well down when the ballots come in. And he's off the council until a few years later when he's appointed to fill a vacancy. The week between Christmas and New Year's in 1937, the new city attorney, William Houston, issues a opinion that say he's not culpable that there was no criminal intent on her part because in previous years she and Jeanette had paid their taxes. This was a one or two year lapse. That the statute of limitations had run out on the other items. And it was basically a problem between Gus England, who was not only the chief of police at this time, but also the tax collector. But there were properties that became delinquent. <coughs> Gus had not secured the deeds get the city to record to have the properties transferred into the city's name. So she gets a clean bill of health. We don't hear about this again until 1940 when there's a whispering campaign when she runs against Monson. 1938, there are two police firings. Beckholt, who's now the commissioner of police, wants to fire Bob Norton, the police chief. He's not successful with that. There's two officers to get relieved, the community rebels, those officers are quickly reinstated. There was also an item in the fire department in 1939 where a couple officers, a couple members, wanted to get Bob Lighting fired as chief. That did not go anywhere. Those two officials or individuals ended up being fired. But you can see we're starting to turn internally. The debates are internal debates. They have to do with the people and not with the height of a building, the zoning for a building, the construction of a road. They're internal. The Carmel Sanitary District went out for assessments and plants to plant in the river in 1939. Those failed. In 1940, there's an election for bonds to enhance the Harrison Memorial Library. Those failed. In 1941, three years into his second term on the council, her parent resigns. 
These are the headlines from Sadie's on it. These are the council members in 1937. These are the headlines after Arkansas Campbell's terminated, and you can see the one that says Democrats have hope from 37. Just another reinforcement of Arkansas Campbell's political affiliation. And Joe Burge's comment about damn Democrats. There's a cartoon that appeared about the council, and the mayor saying, what public? Because he had been chastised so heavily about Campbell's firing. And we work up to 1940, clerk's election. Between 1916 and the mid-1970s, when the city clerk became an appointed position and the city administrator's position was created, there were these two individuals who for 36 years held the office of the elected city clerk. There were nine elections, between Sadie's first election in 1920 and her last election in 1940, only two of those were competitive. Her first one, when she ran against Dewey, there was no incumbent in 1940, and Monster ran against her. For over half the time that there was an elected city clerk, these are the two people that held the position. It was a titanic campaign. The headlines were greater about this race than the council race. Her parent had started mentoring Peter Maudsley in the late 1930s to challenge Sadie. There are references in his diary to meetings at Clara Kellogg's house with Bosley and her. There's a reference to he and Bosley taking a trip down to Pfeiffer in early 1940 regarding, quote, Peter's challenging Sadie, end quote. There was a feeling that Sadie's time had passed. She was now in her 70s. She kept municipal notes on scraps of paper in shoe boxes and stocking boxes. <laughs> she wasn't that friendly with the public or with the council. And the sense was the community had outgrown Sadie or Sadie had not kept up with the community. Bonsley was very popular, very well respected. But Herb and the council make a fatal flaw. <clears throat> Mosley had always told Sadie, by this time he, her Aaron had maneuvered him into being her deputy, but it also protected him by having him an employee of the council for budget and finance. <clears throat> There's an entry in Herb's diary on the Friday before the election where he says the mailers had gone in the mail and Carmelites will get them in their boxes tomorrow. And it was this political advertisement in the bottom right corner. Referencing many former members of the city council who have dealt with Sadie, signed by all five sitting members of the city council. It also runs as an ad in the Herald the Monday before the Tuesday election. See, he's a pretty smart, sweet, smart cookie. Over the weekend, she pens this letter attacking Bodsley, attacking the council, saying they're just money grabbers, I've always protected you. In her campaign, which you know, year after year, it wasn't only addressed to the voters of Carmel, it was addressed to the taxpayers. And there was a dual system of assessments there. There was the city's assessment, which Sadie prepared as the assessor, and there was the county assessment. assessment. So I made that comment about the county assessment. 40 was almost $5 million, and Sadie's was 3.9. That's a huge gap. That's money that the city council doesn't have to spend. But the city council is smart enough to know we're not going to raise taxes. Walter Mondale talked about that in 1984. Look at where it got him. <laughs> 
but they can get Sandy to because she's been so popular and she can fudge the numbers and say these are the numbers or accept the county numbers and she refuses to do it. And she makes that point in her argument about how the county has pressured her, the council members, because all they want to do is raise your taxes. And on Tuesday, election day, Sadie beats Mosley by 100 votes. Exactly 100 votes. <coughs> and as you can see, the headlines are greater than the headlines about the council race that year. So I mentioned the cycle of cities. There's progress, there's pushback, and then there's dormancy. And the community was tired. It had been through the fights in 37 over the audit, the police firings, the firefighters, and Gordon Campbell's termination. They had just been through this big fight for the clerk's position. The old timers were dying out. One senior mistress from the mission had passed away in the 30s. And in 34, Devendorf Pass. In 38, Perry Newberry. In 41, Bill Overstreet. And the blossom was coming off the bloom. Between exhaustion from the public fightings and the age of those who were the creative class that started the golden era, it was over. World War II really put the punctuation mark on it. 1943 was a particularly bad year for old timers. John B. Jordan, who was the first mayor when the title shifted from president of the Board of Trustees to mayor of the city council, longtime owner of the Pine Inn, longtime member of the council, passed away. Xavier Martinez, the mad Aztec as he referred, the local painter who was honored by the California State Assembly, also passed away in January. Argyle Campbell, over the Thanksgiving holiday, had a heart attack and died. In December, the town dog, Pal, passed away. <laughs> Beginning in February of 1943, Sadie contacts pneumonia. She's in and out of the hospital. It lashes over into the early part of, 19, of, of March. She's sent home for a while. She goes back to the hospital. There's a headline about her signing the city warrants from her hospital bed because under the charter or the code of that time, she was the only authorized person to do that. And on Sunday morning, 2.30 of March 21st, Sadie passes away. Her service is on Tuesday. On Wednesday, the city council meets and names Peter Mosley city clerk. <laughs> now there's a book that a guy named Herb Serwin wrote. He was a local flack and advertising man. He wrote a whole story about Richard Hoagland. Hoagland, when he moved to Carmel, was sort of a vagabond. He lived for a while on Upper San Carlos. He lived for a while at the Carmel Inn on San Carlos. He lived for a while at La Rivera. Rivera. <coughs> Sarah Hopi, that he also lived at Sadie's house. They lived brother and sister-in-law, and they had a romantic relationship. I can find no evidence of that. I'm not saying it's not true. But there are so many other things in the article about Hoagland that are not true, that are blatantly false. And you can't question or not question. But I think we got our answer on April 2nd of 1943, when Jeanette Hoagland Parks buries the urns of Sandy Van Brower and Richard Hoagland side by side in the Pacific Grove Cemetery. <laughs> With that, the questions and likes. <laughs> Please give, take this home. This is substantial for the existence of the, the library the foundation. Uh, yes? uh, you said, you know, cities have one golden era. You said they only can have one golden era. No. Um, the, qu the question was, when I made the comment that cities have one golden era, as Cleveland said, each city has one period of magnificence. 
in his book, Cities and Civilization, he identifies one other city that had a second molten era, and it was Paris. There was the Paris in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and then there was the Paris in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But you have to have that right combination of factors, the political, the cultural, and the economic, to make that happen. Silicon Valley, probably now, is in its moment of magnificence. Los Angeles obviously had it in the 50s, except for the smog. But you can pinpoint years for cities, and they don't come around very often for a second chance. Doug, could you comment on the 60s? Because the 60s in this area brought so many, like from the second generation writers to that era. Like the Sarawak and the and everybody that came away. What perspective? Not much. Well, I haven't researched that part yet. <laughs> the question was, was the 60s possibly a second golden era? And I haven't done enough research to comment on that. Oh, Molly. Are there any stories that you'd like to tell us? Oh, there's lots of stories to tell. Um, one of the things that I... I came to realize is that there's another side to the people who we have as icons. Like, we all remember Pierre, uh, Perry Newberry as don't pave Main Street, don't make this a city. And Perry Newberry editorialized consistently in the early 1930s against the state buying Point Lobos for a state park. In 1925, he opined, I think, tongue in cheek that the women's club should run a slate of candidates so women can feel the full burdens of public office. <laughs> so there's, there's another side to, to some of these people. Argyle Campbell overextended himself. I mean, we think of Argyle as he wrote the preamble to the zoning ordinance and we're still idolizing that. And Argyle was city attorney to Pacific Grove, Monterey, Carmel, Soledad. He was attorney to the airport district. He was the attorney to the sardine boat owners in Monterey, and he was chairman of the state Democratic Party. He was really overextended. <laughs> so when the, the council in 37 said, you know, he's gone a lot, we're not getting things in time enough, there may have been some truth to that. Now, the, the one story I enjoy is about Monsignor Mestres. Monsignor Mestres was born in Spain, came to Los Angeles, and the, 1870s was ordained out of the Diocese of Los Angeles, which at that time included Monterey. And Monterey did not become its own diocese, along with Fresno, jointly, until 1924. Monsignor is assigned as the pastor of San Carlos Cathedral in Monterey and of Carmel Mission. Father Casanova had started the renovation of the mission here in the 1880s. St. Carlos needed renovation, and Monsignor Mestres became known as the Padre of Restoration, and he was a charismatic individual. He presided at the wedding of Herbert Hoover and Lou Hoover in Monterey in 1899. Now, there are those who think the first Catholic prelate to officiate at a wedding was Richard Cushing with the Kennedys. No, it was the Monsignor of Monterey in 1899. <laughs> So in August of 1930, the Monsignor passes away. And the notice is published some months later in the newspaper of his estate. Immediately, there's a claim from Bank of America that they have a promissory note for $6,000 that the Monsignor never paid on. And there's a woman, Catherine Raines, who files a claim for $1,900 for services she provided the Monsignor in his latter years when he was ill and he had to go to hospitals in San Jose and Sunnydale in San Francisco. And she was never paid for those services, and she had loaned in about $465 in cash, and she'd never been repaid for that. A couple weeks later, there's a woman in Carmel Woods who's a parishioner at the mission. She has a promissory note for $9,000. She's never been paid on that. The whole estate is valued during probate at 
which in today's money, if you do Google, it comes out to almost $1.1 million for a man who took a vow of poverty. <laughs> but the biggest and the most interesting claim came a few weeks after the one filed by the woman, uh, Carmel Woods. That was by his own bishop, Bishop John Bernardus McGinley, who is very has a crypt in the back of the Carmelite Monastery. He files a claim for $70,000. The church is very nice in its filing. It says that the Monsignor has misappropriated some funds that belong to the parishioners and the bishop. And really they're saying he embezzled the money. He co-mingled the money with his own money which was why he owned property in Pebble Beach, <laughs> why he owned property adjacent to the Carmel Monastery, the Carmel Monastery, he owned lots in Big Sur, and he had about 11 lots he owned in Carmel Monastery. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened with the Carmelite property was there was a woman who wanted to donate the property and been scouted out by the Carmelite order, The Monsignor got her as the representative of the bishop and the church to make the donation to him. And so what he did was carve off some of the property and put the lots in his name, which had a benefit when they did probate because there's still one lot remaining and that lot got sold to help pay off some of the other claims that had accumulated during the probate process. He was so famous that Molly provided me a a uh, newspaper from Savannah, Georgia. He was on the front page when he passed away. That's how well known Monsignor Vestris from Carmel, Monterey was in 1930. His probate took eight years to resolve. <laughs> eight years. It's damn tough finding it, because I thought my dad look in the 30s and it was all the way to 1938. And what happened? Well, the Bank of America and the bishop settled for property instead of cash. Uh, Catherine Raines was left a thousand dollars in the will, so she got that money, so she dropped the rest of her claim. There was a company in San Francisco, Shoewalker and brother, Shoewalker and son on Market Street. They had a promissory note for six thousand dollars, but they were smart enough to get collateral, which were some bonds for an irrigation district in Central California. The bonds didn't mature until 1940, so they kept the bonds, and when they matured, they cashed them in, they got that money. And uh, the rest of it, the executive of the estate sold this, sold that, settled here, settled there. And by 1938, was able to close it out. There's an interesting thing about Sadie's probate as well. When she was in New York, she was Sadie Brown. She moves out here and changes the name Sadie Van Dorn. During her probate, as Jeanette is going through the documents and finds the will, there's reference to a donation left in an estate from a woman named Effie A. Brown, who passed away in 1920 in New York. And Sadie's to get $2,500 from this estate. Never collects on it. So her attorneys, or Jeanette Park's attorneys, have been corresponding with New York, and they find out that the executor of the state in 1920, subsequently, squandered the money. There is no money. There is a subsequent executor of the estate named, he agrees to say he was entitled to money, but there is no money. But he is willing out of his own pocket to pay what the interest would have been on the money from the time of Sadie's passing, or, I'm sorry, from 1920 until the time of Sadie's passing, which is about $463. Jeanette has to go back to court and file petitions that Sadie Brower and Sadie Van Brower are the same people, <laughs> same person, <laughs> which just drags the probate out even longer. Sadie was infamous for not telling the correct age or year in which she was born. As you look through the census documents, if you look at her hospital admission documents, she's always about eight to 10 years younger than she actually was. 
And that's another thing that Jeanette has to correct in the court proceedings because when Sadie entered the hospital on her admission form, she was eight years younger than she actually was. She was 68 when she was actually 75. 67, 68, so. But there are all sorts of little secrets that came out during probate about the mystery woman, Sadie Van Brouwer. Thank you for coming this evening.